weapons or you observe individuals with weapons, you are clear to fire. Now that last attack in Iraq happened in Bakuba. This is one of the most dangerous regions in Iraq still. The town was considered a hotbed of the Al-Qaeda network. Fighters who used to attack coalition forces are now siding with U.S. troops and fighting a common enemy. Talking about the kind of people that I worked with in the militaries, it's actually difficult. It's hard to describe. I almost feel like you wouldn't believe me. So let me tell you a little bit about one of the experiences that I had. In the spring of 2007, my cavalry troop was assigned uh, to Bakuba, Iraq. At the time, it was the capital of Al-Qaeda in Iraq. The city of Bakuba uh, was occupied by at least 4,500 active Al-Qaeda fighters. The number of American soldiers in the city numbered less than 1,000. All right, first day in Bakuba, I spent 12 hours in a sustained firefight in a small suburb called Baritz, which was actually I had the most Al-Qaeda of any spot in the entire world at that point. Uh, we were in a, tw a pitched battle for over 12 hours. And that's with my entire troop of striker armored vehicles reinforced with tanks, uh, Bradley infantry fighting vehicles, continuous uh, air coverage with uh, Apache air weapon teams firing thermal barrack hellfires. It was there that my troop experienced our first real casualties. It's where we lost our It's where we lost a lot of really good people. In many ways, it was the worst experience of my life. In many ways, it was the worst experience of my life. One point, my vehicle had been destroyed by a, being rammed by a suicide car bomb. Uh, vehicle was completely destroyed. We'd all survived, but all with concussions. We were all in pain for a week. Uh, many of us were so nauseous from the head injury, we were vomiting passing out, uh, actually passing out in subsequent firefights under fire. Every time after somebody was blown up, their vehicle would be destroyed. They'd be in great pain, very fatigued. After having got days without any real sleep. Not one of my soldiers ever asked to take a knee. Guys would just get on another truck hours after being blown up. By all rights, should be in bed, should be at a care unit. But the other soldiers in my troop needed them to be there because we fight as a unit, we fight together. But I have never seen men better demonstrate those, those values that I wanted to believe my whole life that that was the kind of men and, and women that American soldiers are. And that experience validated those beliefs. In, in a world full of cynicism, of skepticism, for me to say and, and tell you how incredible these men and women were, see how honorable they were, see their courage, see their compassion for those in need, you almost wouldn't believe it. But I'm here to tell you that's how it is. That's how it was. I saw it myself, and I will always remember that. I will always remember that.
Every generation is the greatest generation. Every generation of Americans has answered the call to arms and fought to preserve the freedom of all Americans. This is the story of those that came home from that fight and how the nation they served received them. This is the story of America and its veterans. It's not always a pretty or happy story, nor is it merely a story about healing the wounds of war. Whatever it is, it is a uniquely American story. This story is not only about the past, but it's also about history that is yet to be written. It's about addressing the challenges of this generation of Americans. Because how we respond to this challenge today will determine what kind of nation America becomes tomorrow. Our soldiers follow the American flag to distant lands far away from their homes and families to put themselves between us and harm's way. Many do not come back. After the fight, those who are fortunate enough to come home to their families ask for very little in return, especially when you compare what they have been willing to give, which is no less than their lives. The veterans that serve in the United States military have an interesting place in, 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 our, in our nation. They are uh, sworn officers of the Constitution in the same way that the President and the members of Congress are as well. But if you look at it merely from a legal constitutional point of view, you almost get the, the, wrong, the wrong view. It's not the legal obligation we have to our veterans, it's something larger than that. It, it transcends that. In the American Revolution, Washington really it has that, that sense. And not only is it sense of, of those who have, have fought and died, but those who have fought together. The Federalist Papers talks at great length about what is it that forms America into a people. And the first example of that question is those who have fought together. Uh, Washington is the first one that uses this, this phrase we, we use today, band of brothers. And he uses it to talk about those who fought in the war with him. And at the end of the Revolutionary War, he says, now go forward, speaking to his, his, his military, his officers, his enlisted. Now your obligation is to go forward and be good citizens. It's a model of citizenship. The year was 1783, the close of the Revolutionary War. General George Washington brought some 7,500 soldiers and 500 women and children to Newburgh, New York to wait out the end of the war and disband the army. This was to be the first generation of American veterans, and there was no precedent for how they should be treated. An anonymous letter was circulated among officers at Newburgh. The letter addressed the failure of Congress to honor its promises to the Army regarding salary and pensions. It was suggested that the Army refuse to disband until those promises were met. This was the so-called Newburgh Conspiracy. Washington knew the unrest was a threat to the young democracy. On March 15, 1783, at the regular meeting of officers, Washington unexpectedly showed up at this church to address his men. In his address, he chastised them for their unmilitary and subversive behavior. This speech was not well received. Following his remarks, however, Washington did something that changed the tone of the assembly and the course of the developing revolt as he took out a letter from Congress explaining the financial difficulties of the federal government, he stopped and squinted at the small writing as his officers waited and stared. Then he did something that few of his men had seen him do before. He reached into his coat pocket and took out a pair of reading glasses. He said, gentlemen, you will permit me to put on my spectacles for I have not only grown gray, but almost blind in the service of my country. The officers were moved, some to tears. They had all sacrificed and suffered as had their great leader. But for everything their nation owed them, they could not now sacrifice the ideals for which they had fought. The conspiracy ended. In the autumn of 1783, despite unresolved grievances, the army laid down its arms and went home. 
I was wounded on uh, June 19th, 2004. I was um, going on a, on a squad level patrol mission. Uh, we were a couple hours into the patrol, um, went around a corner and, and drove right into an ambush and uh, got hit with small arms fire and rocket propelled grenades. And one of those RPGs came through the front of my vehicle, um, hit my, one of my squad leaders, hit me, uh, took off my right arm and caused a lot of other damage just this giant explosion and you know I remember the the sounds the smells um, and then I remember kind of a lot of pain setting in uh, as my right arm was basically torn off and um, you know I was kind of in and out but I remember lo looking for my driver to see if he was still okay and I remember seeing him we made we sort of made eye contact and I said get you know get us out of the kill zone and so the last thing I remember of being in Iraq was getting loaded into the Black Hawk and um, just the feeling of going up in the air and then everything else is is black um, I woke up at Walter Reed Army Medical Center in Washington DC um, a little over two weeks later uh, from a coma and, and you know was was kind of surprised <laughs> to find out that I didn't have an arm and I was no longer in Iraq. I think, you know, it's hard to, to boil down all the great things, um, you know, that come with the opportunity to serve, um, to serve my country in, into just one. But I think that the biggest thing for me was really the, the ability to, to lead troops in combat. I mean, I, I led some of, the, um, some of the smartest, bravest, you know, physically fit, soldiers, male, female, from all, all different walks of life. And to be able to, um, you know, work with those folks, bring, bring a team of people together um, to accomplish a mission in, you know, pretty adverse conditions was, was a remarkable experience. And, and I learned a lot from them. I learned a lot about myself. And, um, you know, I, I, I got to live the dream. I mean, that's, that's what I had been training for. And that's really what I wanted to, uh, to, to, to be able to do. With malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right as God gives us to see the right, let us strive on to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have borne the battle and for his widow and his orphan to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. After the Civil War, when politicians looked at two million Union soldiers, they saw two million votes, and Congress approved an overly ambitious pension for veterans. But that plan quickly became mired in fraud and scandal until it absorbed a staggering 40% of the federal budget. As a result, the pension program was scrapped. But for the veterans of the Civil War, the story didn't end there. Many used their experience and success to play a significant role in making America the world's premier industrial power. As journalist Ida Tarbell wrote in McClure's magazine, Officers in particular were in great demand as business partners and as promoters of new enterprises, their names being considered equal to a good lump of capital. I remember uh, my, my first uh, experience with uh, the potential for combat. I was with the 82nd Airborne Division. We got the call, we were going to Grenada. Everybody was fired up, okay? We, we got kids, I say kids, soldiers hooping and hollering, and now yeah, we're gonna go kill some commies. And, and uh, so we're on the airplane, and everybody's chanting and carrying on, and, and, and then they start loading these, uh, these pallets on the plane, you know? And, People are saying, let's go, let's go, what's the holdup, you know? And I said, oh, we gotta load these pallets. Well, what's in those pallets? Body bags. Whoosh. It was like reality, you know? People are gonna die.
One of the constants in American history is that we treat every generation of Americans different. Maybe the saddest chapter was how we treated the veterans of the Great War, World War I. They, they come back from this horror show of artillery and mustard gas and machine guns, and we gave them, well, really nothing. They got a mustering out pay of $60 and train fare home. The war ends in 1918, but it's not until 1924, six years later, after three presidential vetoes, that Congress finally awards the veterans of World War I a bonus, $625. And there's a catch. The bonus comes in the form of government bonds that can't be redeemed until 1945. That's more than 20 years later. It's a quarter of a century, over a quarter of a century after the war is over. So if you're homeless or you're trying to buy a home or you want to raise your kids, well, your kids would be grown and out of the house long before you ever got your bonus. It, it wasn't much help. With the collapse of the economy during the Depression and their immediate need to make ends meet, veterans asked for an early payout. 40,000 veterans came to Washington to protest. President Hoover had the army drive off the veterans and burn their encampment. Headlines of this bonus march incident brought the shameful treatment of the veterans to the public's attention and cost President Hoover the White House. FDR said the following morning, Hoover just handed me the election. On a night of May 7th of 2007, I was returning from a memorial service for two soldiers that were killed in a, a sister battalion um, in Baghdad, Iraq. Um, I was heading back to my headquarters in a four-vehicle convoy. Uh, my vehicle was the number three vehicle in the convoy when it was struck by a, a roadside bomb or improvised explosive device. The result of that explosion cost me uh, both my legs above the knee as well as a severely damaged right arm. I've been fortunate to be able to continue to serve on active duty after being found unfit medically uh, through a program of continuation on active duty. And so um, I continue to serve. Um, almost five years after being wounded. The young men and women that came home from World War II, they weren't only the greatest generation, they were a different generation. They were well-educated, they were talented, they were highly skilled, they were motivated, they were risk-takers, they were problem-solvers. They just didn't want to go back to their lives. They wanted a better life. And the catalyst for change really was the GI Bill, a package that dealt with housing and education and training and unemployment. In 1945, 12 million American soldiers returned home from World War II. Fortunately for them, a year earlier in 1944, Congress had enacted the Serviceman's Readjustment Act, more commonly known as the GI Bill. By the time the program ended in 1956, over two million veterans had used the GI Bill to attend colleges or universities, with over six million using it to acquire other forms of training. In addition to the millions of professionals in all areas of the workforce, including teachers, doctors, engineers, businessmen, and so on, the GI Bill produced 14 future Nobel Prize winners, three Supreme Court justices, and two American presidents. I haven't experienced, you know, the Vietnam era, uh, served in uh, Southeast Asia, and I was very cognizant of the treatment that a lot of these veterans got. In fact, I remember being at, the, at a football game in Colorado and uh, one veteran had one arm and they were just mocking him and, and making fun of him. And they picked on the wrong guy because he put a serious whipping on a few of them with one arm. And the judge released them, you know, just dropped it. But that was the kind of things that was happening all the way around the country. So I was familiar with that. I've learned today that they treat the veterans 10 times better than they ever did in the past. And uh, I mean, you go to the airports and I see people walking up with uh, shaking hands of the troops, thanking them for their service. That was unheard of back in the 1960s. With no more GI Bill, a sluggish economy, and a hostile public waiting for them, Vietnam veterans came home to a much different America than veterans of World War II. 
public interest in community programs for veterans were scarce. Then, when the Cold War ended, the nation took a peace dividend, a term which refers to the economic benefits of decreased defense spending. Whatever economic benefit there might have been, it did not translate to any significant help or support for veterans. The history of America's veterans is that every generation is treated differently, and it's the responsibility of every generation to figure out how to get it right. There does seem, as much as I've looked at this over and over again, that there are these characteristics that you always see of, of people that just nail it, that just hit it, of things that just work right, that help the veterans and then help themselves. And, and the first one is, as, as kind of simplistic as it seems, it's finding the veteran and identifying what their needs are. That is the single most important step. I mean, lots of people set up programs with all kinds of good intentions, but it's, it's not like the field of dreams. If you build it, they won't necessarily come. If you don't have a program that can't find the veteran, then you don't have a program. The second part that, that really always makes it work is, these programs always work best when it's veterans with veterans. I think anybody could really understand this. Uh, if you walk into a room and you're in a party and you don't know anybody, and there are people that are talking about the kinds of things that you're used to and comfortable with, you're gonna gravitate towards those people. And, and initially, that's where you're gonna feel more, most comfortable with. And the third piece is community. Programs that are rooted in a community are just, are just sustainable. And the fact that they're rooted in a community is not just important for the veteran, it, it really makes the community a better place. Veterans of World War II are known as the greatest generation. What are the veterans of my generation going to be known as? I hope it's not the generation that can we just forget what happened then. If I were to pick one thing to tell uh, a social club or, or a, a club involved in charities, Rotary, Kiwanis, Lions, something like that, and they said, what's the one thing we can do? I'd say hire a veteran. Go find out who they are and hire them. You have young people in, in the Army, Air Force, Navy, Marine Corps, Coast Guard, 20-year-olds who are in charge of uh, the training, the outfitting, the feeding, the, the, the families, the lives of, you know, another 20 or 30 people. The average person in the United States, the average employer in the United States, thinks that giving a job to a veteran is charity. Nonsense. You can't hire anybody better than a veteran. Uh, we've got to change those attitudes. Uh, but what is terrifically important is for America to realize it's not adequate for them to continue to shop at the malls or continue to just simply go to their job, come home, watch entertaining TV, and largely ignoring the fact that we have a huge generation of new veterans uh, who need to be welcomed home. A lot of people don't know how to engage with veterans or talk with veterans, and so I, I think that you know it's it's okay to to engage a veteran and, and to be the one to kind of reach out and you know see you know how how can how can you make them feel comfortable? How can you make them feel included, um, wanted, safe? The nicest thing I think you can do for a returning veteran is to simply thank them for their service and network for these people. If you know of a job opening or a house that's vacant, or if any way that you can help them transition back into the civilian life that they left voluntarily, it would be uh, much more than appreciated. The service member doesn't want to be treated any differently than, than anyone else in the community. They really just want an opportunity to work hard and pursue their dreams uh, just like everyone else. They've seen the worst and the best of life. Uh, they don't like, they're not looking for handouts. Uh, they just want to raise a family, get back to a stabilized life. I think um, a thank you is what most veterans uh, might want to, to hear. You know, uh, a thank you for your service. In 2005, we did lose our son in Iraq and that changed our lives. Gave me a, a whole new perspective on 
little cliches like freedom isn't free. Well, I think it's the responsibility of everyone in the community to support veterans when they come home. I guess you can ask yourself, who is it that they're serving? Who are they protecting? And the answer is all of us. So it really is all of our responsibility. And it's our privilege to do that as well. I've seen valor on the battlefield, a series of noble acts over a period of time under the harshest of conditions. And I've seen valor when they come home, a series of noble acts over a period of time under harsh conditions. And sometimes it takes more than valor. Sometimes it takes a connection within that local community. We come home to our families, our neighbors, and our communities. We don't come home to big government organizations. We fought for our families, our neighbors, our community, and our buddies on our left and our right. And when we come home to the families, the neighbors, the communities, we're looking for buddies on our left and our right. This can't be orchestrated out of Washington, D.C. It has to be a community-based approach that recognizes there are just some things that government can't do that independent organizations working together locally can. But understand, we're not victims, we're veterans. And we don't need pity, we need recognition of potential. And just like our Vietnam veterans, we don't need a handout. We just need a hand up when you come home. If you are a patriot and you do love this country, you'll make sure that we insist that veterans continue to contribute. The only way we're gonna be able to do that is find out who they are, make sure that we take care of them, not because they deserve charity, they're honorable people, but because they can make contributions to your community. If you don't do that, you're letting your community and your country down. The history of America and its veterans has taught us that every generation is treated differently, and it's up to each generation to figure out how to get it right. Now is a new era for America's veterans, but their basic needs haven't changed in over 200 years. This generation does, however, have some unique challenges. We have lost more servicemen and women to suicide than to deaths in combat. Over 90% of those who stay in the service for a full career are married. So it's not just about supporting the men and women in uniform, but also their families. This has been America's longest war, and our nation has no real infrastructure in place to deal with the tsunami of veterans that will soon be returning home, many of which will be entering the civilian workforce. As Americans, it is our responsibility to take care of these brave men and women who have sacrificed so much to fight for our nation's interests. The debt we owe them for their service is great.